<clears throat> well, I would love to tell you about a dream that I have. It's a, it's a past dream. It's a current dream. It's a frankly just, it's frankly just wishful thinking. Uh, but my dream is like, I just, I want a mustache so bad. Like I, I do, I, I, I think mustaches are the coolest. Like when I see a dude with a nice mustache, like I will go give him a firm handshake and say, hey man, you know, respect you. Um, uh, cause it's just, it just, it does make you cooler. And so, um, anyway, uh, I will just say guys, when you can start, when hair follicles start coming out of your face, uh, it, it, it's, it's annoying in one sense. You got to, you know, put work into it and everything like that. But it's also kind of fun too, cause you get to do whatever you want. Like if you want to grow a neck beard and you think that looks good, you can do it. Like you just, it, it, you be you. Like, yeah, you can do, you can do you um, if you want to grow a neck beard. Uh, but I will say this, you can grow whatever you want until you get a girlfriend. And then that changes everything. 99% um, of the time, it changes it for the better. But in the mustache world, it changes it oftentimes for the worst. Um, I was, uh, when we started dating, I was not uh, necessarily growing facial hair. Um, but uh, once I did become growing facial hair, um, I, <laughs> I was dating Karina. And uh, it, was a, it was a no-fly zone for mustaches. She just, she hates them with a burning passion. She thinks it makes any man look incredibly ugly. Like, that's just like what she thinks, um, which, okay, whatever. Uh, so I've tried a few times. Um, I, I've tried a few times. Uh, specifically in college, there was this one time I grew out a really thick beard um, around winter time, and it kept my face really warm in uh, the snow. And then I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I think we we possibly no, we weren't engaged at the time, but we were we were seriously dating um, at the time. And uh, I was just like, you know what? Just I'm gonna send it, and I'm just gonna shave my beard, and I'm gonna keep the stash. And uh, I think I've never looked better. I mean, I think that's that's I peaked. <laughs> I peaked that morning, um, and uh, so I walk out of my dorm, and her dorm is the same place, and we, we meet outside. We're going to walk to class together, and uh, I was just trying to play it cool, like just, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to do it, and just like immediately, it was like disgusting. Shave that off your face right now. Get, uh, get out of my face. Like, she was so mad at me, and I was just like, okay, um, uh, sorry, we're running late to class. I guess I got to keep it. And then, so I did, I, I took it to my 8 a.m. class, and then I came back, and I did shave it after, um, out of respect. Um, but it was one of those situations in which I, I, I tried it, and I still kind of tried to. Like, I let it grow a little bit and kind of shave around it and see if she notices. She does uh, every single time. Um, but if you think about it for a minute, like I've got a face and I've got hair that grows out of my face. You would think, you would think, not all of you have that. You would think I can do whatever I want with my face. And I could do whatever I want with the facial hair that I have. I can groom it in no matter whatever configuration I want to. I, I should be able to do it because it's, it's mine. But what we need to see is that something like a, a mustache, it affects other people if you're in a relationship. What we've been talking about the last couple of weeks of your relationship with God, you think it just affects you because it's you. It is you. It's about you and it's about God. It actually affects, severely affects other people. And so we're going to talk this morning about how your walk with God, it severely affects your relationships with other people. And so therefore, I'd love, love for you to open up to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to see the end of this chapter about this concept of going from death to life, what it looks like to be an old um, non-Christian and to be a new Christian. And the difference between those two things we're going to see this morning of Paul saying to us, your walk with God, it affects other people. Your sanctification, it isn't just about you. As soon as you realize that your walk with God affects other people, you will be able to fight sin with a greater ambition because you believe that it affects other people and you will put on righteousness with the greater zeal because you know that also affects the people around you. And so continuing this concept of putting off and putting on, we want to see this morning that our sin and our righteousness that we put off and put on, it affects our relationships with other people. Let's look at verse 29, perhaps one of the more famous verses in Ephesians. Uh, maybe your parents have quoted this to you before, but let's read it together. 29 through 32. Let's read what we have this morning. Ephesians 4, 29 says this. It says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. 
but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. For let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We see this morning that your walk with God, your sanctification, it affects the people around you. And to zoom out for a minute, this whole section of 17 to 32, we've seen this put off and put on. The putting off the old self, and we talk about this in terms of you as a non-Christian, your former self, what you used to look like. You're taking that off like dirty clothes, and you're having this new, redeemed, pure, sanctified, forgiven self in your new self, and this is now what your life looks like after salvation. So we've been talking about this dirty clothes and the clean clothes, taking off the old self, putting on the new self. And so last week, we gave a couple examples from verse 25 to 28, three examples of things that you need to practically put off in your life. We talked about lying, putting on truth telling. We talked about sinful anger, putting on righteous anger and dealing with it right away. We talked about putting off stealing and putting on honesty and generosity and sharing and hard work with one another. We talked about this concept of you growing in holiness. We used the term last week, sanctification. Sanctification, you don't need to write it down again if you were here last week. Uh, You can if you'd like to. Um, But sanctification is this. It's the ongoing work of God in making the believer increasingly holy day by day. Where this is you putting off the old self more and more every day that you are a Christian. And you're putting on the new self more and more every day as you are a Christian. Growing in holiness, putting off sin, and putting on righteousness. So we see here now... In community with other people, what does my sin, how does it affect one another? Well, look at verse 29. It says, your conversations, the words that you use affect one another. Verse 29 says this, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. The idea here is you're you're saying words to someone else. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the building up as fits the occasion that may give grace to those who hear. We need to put off bad conversations and put on good conversations. So I want you to write it down this way for point number one. Think twice about your conversations. What do you think twice about your conversations? This concept of watching what you say, you've probably heard this before. This concept. Maybe your parents have told you this before. Maybe you've read this verse before. What is it saying here about you taking care of the words that come out of your mouth? Again, it's helpful for us to picture the dirty clothes and the clean clothes. As a non-Christian, you lived in the dirty clothes era where you were just saying things in your life that were just in keeping with your sinful flesh. But now as a new creation, you are now called to a different standard. Now you're called to think twice about your conversations, put off sinful words and put on righteous words. So sub point A, you can write it down this way, put off unhelpful words. This idea of corrupting talk is this picture of words that are unhelpful to the situation. Sub point A, put off unhelpful words. The word here that he uses is the word corrupting. Corrupting is an idea of being unhelpful, something that is tearing down, something that is bad or foul or diseased or unwholesome destructive to something, unhelpful. The word corrupting here was oftentimes used when it was referring to fruit, fruit that had been corrupted. I don't know about you with your fruit. I'm very picky with the fruit and the quality of fruit that I have. I want it to be fresh. I want it to be ripe. You picture this corrupting disease fruit like this. It always happens with strawberries, right? Levi's favorite um, Berry uh, is, is strawberries. It says berry, it means strawberry. And he loves strawberries. And we buy strawberries. And you've had that experience where you look down into the carton and you see the white. And you know that's not ice. That's not, it got a little cold. You know it's mold. What do you see when you have a strawberry that looks like this? First of all, it's mushy, which I'm not into mushy strawberries. That's number one. But number two, I'm not into mold either. Where you see that and you say, no, I'm going to throw this one and then every strawberry around it that has touched the mold, I'm going to throw it away and then I'm going to dig and I'm going to see if there's any good ones and maybe I can eat a good one if I wash it off correctly or whatever. Where you say, no, no, I, I don't want the bad because why wow, this is going to hurt me. This is going to be bad. This is going to hurt my stomach. Corrupting talk is this picture of a bad fruit, diseased fruit. Conversations that tear down and are destructive 
and are unhelpful. I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 12 to see this. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. I'd like you to see this idea of corrupting talk that Jesus talks about. A little bit different word that he uses here in this text. But I want you to see that your conversations, the words that you give, that you say, that hurt and are destructive, that are corrupting, that are like moldy strawberries, it's actually a big deal. And I would, I, I would think most people in this room treat their words as not that big of a deal. You think right now about your last week of life. You probably said some things that you regret, right? You probably said some things that were angry, probably said some things that were selfish, probably said some things that were complaining. You're like, oh man, you feel like you get out of a conversation, you're like, mm, I shouldn't have said that. Nah, everyone does it. No big deal. Once you see if you're a Christian, this actually is a big deal. This is like you eating moldy strawberries. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, it says this. It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruits bad. For a tree is known by its fruits. The idea here is if you're a non-Christian, you're going to bear good fruit. If you're, or sorry, if you're a Christian, you're going to bear good fruit. If you're a non-Christian, you're going to bear bad and corrupting fruit like the strawberry. He says, verse 34, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? What he's saying here is that if you are not a real Christian, how can you speak what is good in alignment with God? It says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If your heart is a heart of flesh, sinful flesh, where you are doing whatever you want and thinking whatever you want, your words, you shouldn't be surprised, are bad. Because what Jesus says here is that whatever your heart is, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. It says, verse 35, the good person, out of the good treasure, he brings forth good. He's got a good heart, the spirit living inside of him, he brings forth treasure that's good. But the evil person, out of the evil treasure, he brings forth evil. One of the scariest verses in all the Bible, right here, Matthew 12, 36, look at it. He says this, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will either be justified or by your words, you will either be condemned. This is a scary passage of scripture because it reminds us that our words matter. And it says here in the last two verses, it says we're going to be judged by our words. In verse 37, it's kind of confusing. You can misinterpret it. And I don't want you to misinterpret it. I want you to interpret it rightly. It says, for by your words, you will either be justified or by your words, you will be condemned. The idea here is that God is going to judge your life, and if your life is defined by someone who is enslaved to their sin in the realm of corrupting talk, where you are doing, you, you say corrupting talk all the time, you will be judged by that, and it says here that you will experience the judgment of God. But a real Christian, they have been transformed from the inside out, where now the overflow of their heart, their mouth is speaking good things, and it says they will be justified. It doesn't mean that they'll be saved by saying good things, but what it means here is that when God on Judgment Day looks at you, he's going to look at your life, and he will send people living in their flesh, he'll send them to hell, and he'll send people that are to heaven. If you are a Christian, I want you to hear this today. Your words, they matter, even the smallest of complaints even the smallest of talking back to your mom. Those things matter to God, and it says you will stand before the judgment seat of God for every careless word. And I'll tell you what, that's probably a lot of words. That's probably a lot of careless words. That fear that you have right now, and that quiet that has now permeated it in this room where you're like, oh, this is a big deal. I want that to affect your Tuesday afternoon when you're at school with your friends, and you have an opportunity to have corrupting talk. I want it to affect your Wednesday night where you are in conversations with other people at CSM. Your conversations, they matter. I want you to think right now, but what does your speech look like? Does it look like a good fruit or bad fruit? Picturing these two fruits next to each other I think is helpful. Which one, honestly, can you say your speech looks the most like? That's a scary question to ask. And I want you to hear, I'm not saying speak more good things and you will be saved. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is real Christians, their speech reflects the heart that they have inside of them. We're a Christian, they, their heart is made new and their words are now made new. You should want to stay as far away from that as possible. We talked about this actually a couple weeks ago in Ephesians 4. Verse 17, where it says, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. 
Remembering your old self and saying, I want to stay as far away from that corrupting talk that I used to talk in all the time. Don't be content with occasional slip-ups because you know what? Everyone does it. But say, no, I'm going to be serious about this because my speech matters to God. I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of God one day and he's going to judge me for it. Which means the conversations that you have, you need to be praying more often about them. I want you to write this one down. Psalm 141, verse 3. Psalm 141, verse 3. Listen to what the psalmist says here. This prayer that he offers to God. He says this. He says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. What if you prayed that before you went to school? What if that was something that you were thinking and meditating on when you were at CSM? What about when your mom tells you to do something you don't want to do it? What if this was on your mind? What if when someone says something mean to you and you have an opportunity to lash back out, what if this is something that you were thinking about because you've memorized it, you're meditating on it, and you're praying it? Pray for your conversations, for your words with other people. Something that I try to do oftentimes to myself is ask myself the question, is this conversation, is it a helpful conversation or is it an unhelpful conversation? And oftentimes that helps tell me if I should be in this conversation or not in the first place. Is this a helpful conversation or is this unhelpful? If it doesn't build up, then you should get out of it or you should help other people stop having that conversation. Some example of some, help, of some unhelpful corrupting words would be things like gossip and slander, putting other people down, bullying one another. What is that? That is you taking someone down, pulling them down, destroying their reputation, making them look worse than they really are because you selfishly want other people to view them lower. Another word for that is defaming. Defaming is this idea of taking something that looks good and then tearing it down and and messing it up and destroying it. Your conversations, do they defame other people or do they build up other people? Your words that harm other people, it's a big deal. James 4, 11 and 12 says this. It says, do not speak evil. The idea of speaking evil is this this picture of harming other people with my words. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. So he's talking to the church. Between brothers and sisters in Christ, don't speak evil against one another. It says the one who speaks against his brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law. Basically, he sets himself up as the judge of someone else rather than letting God do it. It says this, verse 12, it says, but you... But who are you to judge your neighbor? It's this reminder that when you gossip and when you slander, you set yourself up as the judge with his robe on, with the gavel to say, I know best and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to determine if this person speaks good or speaks not good in this situation. You're a judge. And this passage tells you that there's only one judge. God is going to judge. We just read it in Matthew 12. We're going to stand before God one day. We're gonna, every careless word we've ever said, we're going to have to stand for Another thing is inappropriate joking, profanity, cursing, cussing, whatever word you want to use. Corrupting talk that, ter- that, that is unhelpful, that is out of place, that is not okay. I want you to see it. Actually, uh, look down the page. If you're back in Ephesians, look down the page in chapter 5. Chapter 5, uh, verse 4. We'll get to this um, in uh, two weeks. Um, it says this, let there be no filthiness. That's a helpful picture of the grossness coming out of your filth. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But it said, let there be thanksgiving. So he does another put off, put on with our conversations. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. But the idea here is that you should have a very close guard on the jokes that you make to say, ah, everyone else does it. It's okay. No, you're inappropriate joking. It matters because you will stand before God one day for every careless word that you've spoken. And so think about the picture of the strawberry. Is my conversation tearing down and destroying or does it look nice and pretty like the ripe, perfect red strawberry? What do your conversations look like? Put off the unhelpful and then sub point B, you need to put on productive words instead. Put on productive words instead. When you're done writing that down, look back at this verse. It says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Instead of that, put off that. It says, but now put on only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Look at the couple adjectives that he uses here back in this text. Verse 29, he says, but only such as is good. Something that is good is something that fits just right. It's perfectly appropriate. It's perfectly suitable. 
for building up. The word building up is an interesting word. It's literally the word for making a house, taking something from the ground and then putting the edifice together to, to, to productively make something stand tall. Building up, edifying the conversation, helping one another as fits the occasion, that it's timely, that it's at the appropriate time and place, that it may give grace to those who hear. I want you to think, are my conversations productive? Are my words productive? I want you to not view your conversations as they're no big deal, they're wastes. It doesn't matter because everyone does it. No, you have an opportunity, every conversation you have, to build up or to tear down. Attentive to the situation, attentive to the needs of the other person. This idea of good fruit. A couple of verses for you as we picture this idea of good fruit, like the nice ripe strawberries. Proverbs 25, 11 says this. It says, a word fitly spoken is like an apple of gold in its setting of silver. What he's saying here is that when you speak the right thing at the right time, it is just a beautiful, perfect thing that just fits right into place. Proverbs 20, or 15, 23 says, to make an apt answer. Apt answer is the idea of uh, a right, um, it, at the right time, it's appropriate answer. A good timing answer is a joy to a man. And a word in a season, how good it is. To make an apt answer is a joy to men, and a word in a season, how good it is. The timing and the content of your conversations matter. If you don't get anything out of the sermon today, I want you to remember that your conversations matter. That's probably the twelfth time I've just said that exact sentence over and over again. I'm not repeating myself because I forgot my place. I'm repeating myself because that's the point of this text right here. Your conversations, they matter. Does it give, look at this verse, does it give grace? Does it help give grace building other people up? That it is a good, profitable thing. I want you to picture someone walking away from your conversation. What is their response to your conversation? Do they have grace in their life? Are they built up to go do something good? Or they feel encouraged? Or do they walk away feeling like, man, that person, they were really harsh. Man, that person, they were kind of a bully. Man, that person was just kind of rude and unkind. I want you to picture even the person walking away from your conversation. What is, their, what is them walking away? What are they feeling? That you built them up or that you tore them down? That you gave grace or you didn't? Why does this matter? Well, look at verse 30. It matters a lot because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. Look at verse 30. Ephesians 4 verse 30. He says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What he's saying here to give you motivation of why your words matter is because the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, lives inside of you. And you hurt him. The word here is grieve him. When you say things that are corrupting talk, when you let that come out of your mouth, when you don't build other people up, when you don't give grace to the person in your conversation, you hurt the Holy Spirit. We talked a little bit about that at camp. Hurting your parents versus, you know, hurting one of your parents versus hurting both of your parents versus hurting a close friend, a teacher, a a small group leader. But then hurting God himself, he is a resident inside of you if you're a Christian. Do you picture yourself hurting God in your conversations? I want you to. I want you to because that's exactly why Paul says you should put off the corrupting talk and put on the righteous talk. I want you to think right now about the Holy Spirit. What did the Holy Spirit come to do? He came to change you from the inside out. He came to make you new. He saved you. Jesus, obviously his sacrifice saved you, but the Holy Spirit, he comes in and he transforms you. The, the theological word is regeneration, where he gives you new life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Now he's living inside of you, and you go back to him, and you slap him in the face every time you have an unhelpful, corrupting conversation. After all that he's done for you, after everything he's done, you go back and you slap him in the face. It's like if you're on a vacation with your parents, and your parents pay a bunch of money for a nice cruise or something like that and you're just a lousy, complaining, annoying person. Can you picture that? I know that none of you are, well, some of you, I guess, are a dad, uh, students, but you think about how much hard work it takes to go pay for a vacation of a kid that doesn't care, and then now what it's describing here is the one that has paid all of this money for you to be on it, now you're going back to him, and you're hurting that person. Complaining, getting mad at, pointing the finger at your dad after he's paid for you to go on vacation is what I want you to picture here when it shows what the Holy Spirit has come to do and you hurting him. 
after all that he's done. We're putting off hurtful words and we're putting on helpful words. Put off and put on. That's the picture that I want you to have of this unhelpful and this profitable and productive words. Thinking twice about our conversations, but look at where he goes next. He just kind of puts a conclusion sentence in which he kind of sums everything up with a bunch of different sins and a bunch of different virtues together. Look at verse 31. He gives a bunch of put-offs. He says this. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, along with malice, be put away from you. Put off these things that hurt your relationships with other people. He goes from very specific in a couple of these examples of lying and stealing corrupting talk, but now he starts to go general in terms of your relationships with other people. What is your heart behind it? What is your relationship? What is it marked by? I want you to write this down this way for point number two. I want you to choke out relationship killing tendencies. Choke out relationship killing tendencies. General relationship sins. You have sinful tendencies to do all of these things that verse 31 describes here. Every single one of them. How do I know that? Because, one, that's every human being. Two, I experience all of these. Three, I've watched you play a bunch of these out in your life as well. Bitterness. Have you ever been bitter before? Wrathful, angry, clamorous, which means you're yelling, anger, slander, tearing other people down, having malice, destructive um, uh, feelings and, and uh, desires for other people, hoping that they fail. Every single one of us, in our sinful flesh, all of these are in there. Every single one of them. And so when you live according to the flesh, you grieve the Holy Spirit. And these are things to look out for, to just kind of pair them off so you can see them a little bit more um, systematically. It says, the first one says, bitterness, wrath, and anger. These are all more internal, inside the heart. So sub point A, I want you to do this. I want you to choke out. Some point, an internal bitterness. The things, the sinful programming that you have inside of you. I want you to treat your internal bitterness as a big deal. What I mean by bitterness in this point is, I'm trying to kind of summarize these three here of bitterness, wrath, and anger. So to summarize all three, I give you one, (laughs) is the idea. But bitterness, I hope I don't have to explain and define this to you too much. Bitterness is this desire that you have inside of you that is this foul and gross uh, view of somebody else, an intense maybe hatred or resentment from someone else inside of you, where you look at them and you get upset. Wrath and anger are obviously very close synonyms there of, of, of sinful reactions or, or harboring anger within one's heart. And it says here that you need to make sure that this doesn't come out. He says, let it all be put away from you, put off with your old self. This idea of bitterness elsewhere, and when it's translated as a verb, it's translated as the word harsh. It actually shows up in Colossians 3.19 when it's talking to husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives, and it says this, do not be harsh with them. That's the verb form of bitter. So if, if you need to see what bitterness looks like in real life, it looks like harshness. It looks like you, um, this resentfulness and, and ill feelings towards someone else, it, it comes out now in your relationship with them. And look at this verse here. Again, not to break down husbands and wives right now. We'll get to that actually in a couple weeks as well. But look at this, what it says for husbands to do. It says, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do you see how it gives a put off and a put on? Where the opposite of love is for you to be harsh and bitter towards someone else. They're opposites, they're antonyms. So how do I know if I've got wrathfulness, if I've got anger, if I've got bitterness in my heart towards someone else? something that my old youth pastor used to describe is do this little test on yourself. What do you think about when someone walks through the door of a room? Like, what does your mind first go to? Honestly, try that. It's a very convicting exercise to do. You just picture, and I don't want you to just like stand right here and just like watch everyone that walks inside and, you know, internally judge everyone. But I want you to see that when someone walks through the door and you have that initial reaction of, what is that showing you? That shows you, you have something inside of here that is bitter, that it is angry, wrathful, inside of you towards someone else. 
You walk some, someone else walks into a room and you're like, oh man, that guy, man, he's, he's awesome. He's super encouraging. Okay, well, then you probably don't have bitterness towards that person. But it is helpful for you to kind of parse out to see who you have bitterness for and who you don't have bitterness for so that you can now know, you have a name in your head to say, mm, I'm bitter towards that person. I'm gonna start praying for that person. I'm gonna start serving and loving that person. So do that exercise of, <laughs> it sounds bad, but like judging someone when they walk through, that's not what I really mean. What I mean is for you to see inside your heart, do you have bitterness towards other people? How do you undo this bitterness? How do you fight against this internal bitterness, this wrathfulness, this anger? Well, I want you to first hate it. I want you to first hate this sin more and declare war on it. Say, I'm not okay with it anymore. That's what I was trying to do for you in point number one by explaining to you that you have all of these, the, these corrupting talks and you treat them like no big deal. They are a big deal. I want you to treat these things inside of your heart as a big deal. Hate them. Don't assume just because I didn't act on it, I just felt it in my heart, it doesn't make it, it, it means it's not sinful. That's not the point at all. You can sin in your heart that no one else will see all day long. Treat the sin in your heart as a big deal. And then also try to figure out why you feel that. Again, going back to that exercise of what do I think about someone when they walk through the door? And you do have that reaction of, oh, I don't, I don't like that person. Like, mm, they really hurt me and I, I just, I don't like them. Ask yourself the question of why, why do I do that? Why do I do that? Well, I do that because they, they hurt me one time and I didn't like that. I hurt my feelings. So what does that show you? When you, th when you assess that in your mind, that shows you that you don't know how to forgive someone. That's what it shows you. When you are get mad or something because someone hurt your feelings, I don't know how to forgive this person. So therefore that's helpful for you to understand why you're doing whatever you're doing, why you're feeling what you feel. And then also I want you to pray against it. Pray that God will give you a love for that person instead. Look at uh, Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. It says this, it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. Not out loud, not yelling at him, but even in your heart, it says, do not hate your brother. For you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. Look at this. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hating someone in your heart, loving someone in your heart, those two things are opposite. And so when you have those bitter feelings towards someone, wrathful, angry feelings towards someone, once you see, this is someone, top of my list, now that I need to start loving better. Which means, number one, I got to be with this person. I got to hang out with them, even if I don't like them, because I need to now know them better. I need to now serve them better. And so even having that idea of understanding them, to, or understanding your need to, to love them, rather, to put that to death in your heart. Because if you don't put it to death in your heart, you'll see these other things show up. Look back at this text. It says, let put all bitterness, wrath, anger, and it says, also clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Now this is where the internal, it now goes external. So subpoint B, write down this way, external outbursts. Internal bitterness and external outburst. Clamor, slander, and malice are these external outbursts of exposing the internal bitterness. Clamor is this idea of yelling and screaming, shouting, loudly fighting, slander, tearing someone down, defaming them, gossiping about them. And malice is kind of an all-encompassing term to say anything else hateful that I missed falls under the word malice is kind of what Paul is doing here. Do these show up in your life? Clamor, slander, and malice externally. If you notice an outburst, I want you to see that it's not just go home and don't have an outburst anymore. It's now go home and fix the heart. The, what's going on on the inside? Because you cannot be clamorous, you cannot be slanderous, you cannot have malice if your heart is not bitter, angry, and wrathful. They all build on one another. They're all going from the inside, now going outside. Picture this example right now. Someone that throws up, okay? Let's just picture someone throwing up, okay? Some of you need a picture, some of you don't need a picture. It. Picture throwing up. What does throwing up communicate? Throwing up, it's an external, it comes out of someone, and you can just assume that that person is sick or they've got something going on on the inside. So the external, for you, it helps expose what's going on internally. That that person that just threw up has something going on in their stomach that doesn't feel super good. 
whether it's ate something bad, whether it's just stomach flu, the external exposes what's going on internally. Just like these right here. The external of outbursts and getting mad, it exposes what's going on inside the heart. The angry heart exposes itself as angry outbursts. And so therefore, if you want to stop being angry in an outburst way, you need to work on your angry heart. Stop clamoring, slandering, malicing against one another. Same thing to do, same process of putting it to death as I just gave you for the sub point A. Hating it. Figuring out why it's there. Praying against it. Repenting of it. Confessing it. Asking for accountability on it. Loving and serving that person instead. Outbursts, internal bitterness, they go together and they expose one another. And so therefore, if you want to put these to death, look at verse 32. It says, but instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Point number three, right down this way, you need to reprogram your mindset to love. Reprogram your mindset to love. Love, it starts in the heart and it goes outward. Just like the idea of the vomiting with the upset stomach, just like the angry heart with the angry outburst, reprogram your mindset to love. All three of these in verse 32, kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiving, that all kind of falls under this one category, this umbrella of love. P.E. has defined this term love many times. He even defined it actually in the main service just a couple minutes ago. And so to just cite my sources and tell you where I got it from, this is P.E.'s definition of what love is, biblical love. It's this, it's seeking the greatest good at any cost for one another. Where you care about someone so much that you are willing to do whatever it takes to serve them, to care for them, to do whatever you can to help benefit them. Going back to what we just talked about with words, corrupting talk. It says, just don't have corrupting talk, but it says now use your conversations to build one another up as fits the occasion that it, give me grace, that it may give grace to those who hear. What is that? That's you caring for the good of someone else. How are you as a Christian able to love one another? Is it just you taking this sermon, writing down all these sub points and saying, I'm going to go home and I'm just going to do it? No. Have you tried that before? Have you tried to just take a sermon, just go do it? You know? How, how do you do it? Well, first of all, you have to be transformed by God's love first and have a high view of what God did for you. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says this. It says, beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So therefore, you love other people. It exposes that you have a relationship with God. It says anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because look at this. God is love. The definition of love is who God is. Therefore, real Christians, they can love because God first loved them. If you go try, as someone living in your flesh this week, and you're a non-Christian, you just try to go love other people, you will fail. I'll see you next Sunday. Try again. That doesn't work. You need to be changed, transformed, forgiven by the love of God, understanding what Jesus did for you, repenting of your sins, placing your faith in him, he transforms your heart. He takes off your dirty clothes. He puts on those clean clothes of your new self. And now your heart is now programmed to love. But we as Christians, we need to reprogram oftentimes and be like, right, yeah, that's right, this is a good reminder. This is a good reminder. I'm reprogramming. Yes, I, I, that's right, I need to love other people. This sermon is not necessarily not necessarily, not at all, revolutionary. Love other people. It's just what the Bible has said a thousand times over. God loved you. You can now love other people. And look at the ways that loving other people, look at what it looks like externally speaking. Someone who has love in their heart, look back at verse 32. The first one, it says, be kind to one another. That is a command. Be kind. That's an imperative. That's a command. Be kind to one another. Sub point A, be kind. Simple as that. Not super creative of a, of a sub point there. Your mindset this week is how can I be kind to one another? Kindness. The idea of being good and pleasant and agreeable. Easy to talk to. It's a command here. 
Christians cannot be unkind. I'm going to say that again. Christians cannot be unkind. An unkind Christian is a contradiction in terms that doesn't exist because they have been loved by God, transformed by God's love, because God was kind to them. They now have to be kind, obligated to be kind to one another. I want you to think right now, as you look around this room, are the people in this room, when they view you and they think about you, would they say and agree that you specifically are a kind person? If you cannot answer that question well, that's your homework. Do you need to be kind? Coming from someone who used to be very unkind in my non-Christian self, I was very unkind. God has transformed my heart to now be someone who, Lord willing, I am known for spreading and being kind to other people when I used to not be kind because of what God's love did for me by transforming me from the inside out. And can I just say this for one moment? Many of you girls here, you guys are, you guys are pretty kind. But let me talk to the guys for a minute. A lot of you guys genuinely, like man to man, or at least facial hair to non-facial hair, like you're not kind. I'm just going to say it. Some of you are not kind, straight up. And if you're not kind, I want you to see that as a big deal. Again, that's my phrase of the sermon. It's a big deal. Why? Because number one, you're commanded to do it. But number two, if you're a Christian, God has been so kind to you. Stop being a bully. Stop making fun of everyone else when they drop a pass when we're playing football. Stop being unkind because Christians cannot be unkind. Girls, some of you guys got a head start. You're just born with a kind spirit and God is using your kind spirit to be kind to other people. That's awesome. Some of you guys need to work harder on your kindness. It's not a girl attribute to be kind. No, it's a Christian attribute to be kind. Every single one of us need to be kind, guys and girls. If you are kind, great. If you're, if you're a girl, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. If you are kind, kind guy as well. Increase your kindness. Be more kind. Who can I be kind to this week? Who can I be kind to that I'm normally not super kind to? How can I grow and increase in this idea of being good and pleasant and agreeable, easy conversations with other people? Be kind to one another. And the next one, it says tenderhearted. That's probably not a word that we use oftentimes, but maybe this is a word that we do use more often. The word tenderhearted is literally just the word for compassion. So sub point B, you need to be compassionate. Compassionate. This idea of tenderhearted is you've got, I'm just going to say it, sensitive feelings towards other people where you care for them. That's not a girly thing either. That is a Christian thing as well. To have feelings Care, care, where you have empathy, care for one another. Jesus had a very tender-hearted, compassionate heart for you. If he didn't, we'd all be here and we'd all be going straight to hell because we'd have no savior to come save us because Jesus had to be kind to come to planet Earth. He gave us an example even of what kindness looks like. But you have been now given, if you're a real Christian, God has taken an angry heart that your heart was programmed to do and is now giving you a new compassionate heart where you now desire to do kind and compassionate things, where you're sensitive and empathetic towards other people. If Jesus did not have compassion for you, you'd be stuck. And so therefore, you need to have that same type of compassion for other people. If you do not care about other people, I want you this week to pray about it. Pray, God, Give me compassion and care and empathy towards other people. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Hurt me for the sake of other people when your heart is hurt for them. That goes in an evangelism sense for people that are not Christians, that are on their way to hell. That also goes for one another. We actually care. Do you care? Genuinely, do you care about other people in this room? Do you care about the people in your small group? Do you care about your small group leader? Do you care about your friends? If you think it's just too cool to like be caring of other people because it's such a, a beta thing to do, like that's not what the Christian life is all about. Jesus cared for you. You'd be going to hell if he didn't. 
And so therefore, this is a reminder for us to care, be compassionate, tenderhearted, and sensitive towards the needs of other people. And then look at the last one, probably the hardest one of all, is this, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Subpoint C, forgive because you are forgiven. Forgive because you're forgiven. This reminder that God has forgiven you of your sin. When you are wrong, you have the ability and now the obligation to forgive other people. Do I need to explain how much sin and how much debt you've racked up before God? Explain to you how bad your sin is? I hope I don't need to explain that to you because you picture Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. What is that? Yeah, that's kindness. Yes, that's compassion. But that's him dying so that you could be forgiven, so that your debt can be paid. Therefore, you, since your debt can be paid and you understand how bad your sin is, you can do that for other people. Psalm 103, 11 and 12 says this, For as high as the heavens are above you, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. Look at this verse. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression from us. God has forgiven you from so much sin. When people sin against you, it is a small little fraction of what you've done to God. Who are you to not forgive your brother when God has forgiven you a giant debt? And I'll tell you this, this is the hardest one in the list for sure. Absolutely the hardest one in the list because when people wrong you, what do you want to do? You want to lash back out. You want to provide justice. You want to make them feel bad. You got to forgive because look at how far your sins have been moved away from you. East is from the west. You could go east forever. You could go west forever. You're never going to go back the other direction. That's as far as God has removed your transgression, your sin from you harboring resentment in your heart, bearing grudges against one another. That is so unchristian. That is so ungodly. Yes, it hurts when people offend you. It hurts when people do wrong things to you. But you've been forgiven way more than anyone could. You, you've done so much more wrong to God than, you, than someone else could ever do to you. Therefore, you can forgive this much because God has forgiven this much. Be kind, be compassionate, forgive one another putting off bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, putting on kindness, compassion, and forgiveness with one another. Hopefully these last two weeks have given you a picture of what the Christian life looks like. Just to recap our past two weeks, the old dirty clothes and the new clothes, hopefully you're seeing these put off and put on in your life. The first one we talked about was lying and truth-telling, sinful anger and righteous anger and conflict resolution, putting off stealing, putting on hard work and sharing, putting off unhelpful words, putting off productive words, and to sum it up as best as I could, putting off selfishness and putting on love. Let's go live like people who have been transformed, who have been given new clothes, new creations this week, living out these, putting off and putting on. Let's bow our heads and pray right now. God, we thank you for loving us so much. God, as we even just briefly talked about the forgiveness that you've offered to us is far more than we could ever truly understand. And God, every student in this room has racked up a giant debt of sin towards you. And God, you've loved them. You've loved me and forgiven us and me for our sins. And God, this week, when people hurt us, when there is temptation to be wrathful and angry and slanderous and clamorous and bitter towards other people. God, give us this love that only you can provide for us. We cannot just manufacture this on our own and go try to apply a sermon because we heard something about loving other people. But God, you have to do this inside of us through your Holy Spirit. So I do pray that you would do that this week in my life. You do that this week in these students' lives, in these leaders' lives. God, that we would look less like the world, less like our flesh, and more and more like Jesus Christ each and every day, loving and caring, compassionate and kind like he was. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.